Well, good morning, Trinity Fellowship, and welcome to church. Great to see everybody. Welcome to everybody that's with us online, of course, as well as everybody at every location. It's great to gather today. And I'm so excited. We're continuing in our series on Kingdom Blessing, the extraordinary life found in God's kingdom. Today, we're talking about parenting in the kingdom. But before I get to that, I want to make just an announcement, and that is that next weekend is baptism weekend at every single campus. And so I want to encourage you, if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, but you have not yet been water baptized, I want to encourage you to take that step. Just come early to any campus that you attend, and we will be there with towels and shorts and shirts and everything you need to get you water baptized. You know, it's the first command that Jesus gives us, that after we accept him, that we be water baptized. And if you haven't, I want to encourage to take that step, it will empower you and transform you. And I'm just excited. You know, we've baptized, I believe, more people this year than ever in the history of Trinity Fellowship Church. We've had over 900 baptisms so far. Yeah. It's amazing. So we want to encourage you to be a part of that. Come next weekend ready to get water baptized. All right. If you have your Bibles, go to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to be in verse 1. Or if you're tracking along in the app, you can just follow along there. All of the verses are there. And as we've been going through this series, we're talking about the kingdom blessing and how when we bring what the aspects of our lives into God's kingdom realm, we take them out from underneath the curse and we put them underneath God's blessing so that we can then see his hand of blessing on it. We can begin to see it multiplied and things begin to move forward for us. Jesus died on the cross to restore what we had prior to the fall. That was was part of what Jesus did on the cross. Part of covering and paying for our sin was opening us up to the opportunity to go into his kingdom realm and to restore what it was like in the garden when there was complete unity and walking with God and all of the things, the blessings that come from that. And so we've been looking at how our human tendency towards comfort and control is what keeps us outside of the kingdom. So if you're just kind of joining us, this is our our doorway into God's kingdom realm. And we've been talking about how we can be saved and then yet still stand and live under the curse when we're holding on to things and not doing things God's way. And we've been talking about it's comfort and control that keep us in that place and keep us from going through the door. And we've titled the door, It's Not About Me, recognizing that it's about him and it's about Jesus and surrendering to his lordship. And so today, as we're talking about parenting, we're going to look at how do we do our parenting inside the kingdom. Now, I want to say this. All of us are not necessarily in the same stage of life as parenting. And I'm going to pray for all the parents here in just a minute who are actively parenting. But I want to encourage you, this message is for you, even if you're a grandparent or if you're a pre-parent, you know, if you're a high school student, here's one thing. Every single one of us is a child of God. Is that true? That's right. So as a child of God, we can learn how to be better kids for the most incredible parent that there is. And so there's something for each one of us as we go through this message. But I am going to be talking about parenting and how do we do parenting in God's kingdom realm. But I want to start with this. I want to start with praying a blessing. And so here's what I'd like to do at every location. If you are actively parenting, and here's what I mean by that, you have kids in the home. You have kids birth zero, so you're, you're pregnant, you're carrying a child. All the way through to 20-somethings, they're basically still on the payroll. You're still in charge, right? You haven't, you haven't gotten rid of them. Right? Anywhere in that phase, would you stand up, wherever you are, at every location, we want to pray for you. Yeah, you guys are awesome. If there's somebody standing around, you just kind of extend hands to them. And I just want to say this, just as we get going, you're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. Come on, let's give them a hand. They're doing a good job. You were doing one of the most challenging, the most rewarding, incredible jobs on the planet, and you're doing a good job. Just the fact that you're here and still alive and your kids are still going, you're doing good. You're doing good. So be encouraged and be excited about that. And let's pray a blessing on them. Father, right now, I just pray for every parent right now in Jesus' name. Just bless them. Father, right now, give them energy. Give them life. Give them refreshing as your spirit comes upon them. Father, let them just receive from you this morning just nutrients for their parenting soul. And Father, for the worry and the anxiety over that one or that child or the prayer or the working through the various things that are going to be worked through, Father, we just pray right now, just peace. Your peace, your supernatural peace to just come and to settle hearts. And Father, we're thankful this morning that you know every child. You know every challenge, you know every opportunity, you know everything that they're going through, everything that they're in, every stage of development. And Father, you have a perfect plan for them, 
and you have aligned them with the absolute perfect parents for that child. So Father, bless these parents, fill them with strength and energy and joy as you continue to encourage them on the journey that they're in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Come on, let's thank God for all the parents one more time. Y'all are doing great. Y'all are doing great. All right, so here as we're going through and we're talking about parenting, I want to start with the foundation. Now, I'm not going to go into like parenting, a lot of parenting tips necessarily, but I want us to have a biblical framework for parenting. And so we're going to start with this. Every child, and every parent knows this, but let's state the obvious. Every child born into the world has a sin nature. Is that fair? Every child born into the world has a sin nature. They're born under the curse. And it's, it's critical that we see this. Now, we can know this experientially. We can see it as we're parenting children. You know, Kim and I have parented three wonderful kids. Our youngest now is 26 and has two uh, beautiful children of their own. So we, we remember along the way, you don't have to be reminded that children come with this in nature. But it's helpful to understand the biblical framework of that so we can understand what our job is as parents. So they came, the, the children come imbued prepackaged, if you will, with a tendency towards the exact same sin that got Adam and Eve. And so if we look at what this sin is, it can help us as parents know what it is we're trying to help partner with the Lord to get out of them. And we call this sin original sin or inherited sin. So original sin or inherited sin, both the same thing. Now, in a, when we say what is it, in a word it's selfishness, but really, original sin goes much deeper than just selfishness. So let's look at the story here where I ask you to turn in Genesis 3. So the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It is only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the certain serpent, repl serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. Now listen, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. That's the key there. So the woman, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and that its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. She gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Original sin is what caused people to believe they have the wisdom necessary to discern good and evil for themselves. This is what actually is the part of our flesh, after we're born again, the part of our flesh that still has to be sanctified. It still needs to become more and more Christ-like. There's still a part of us that sometimes we think we know better than God. We think we know better than what he does. We think we can choose good and evil for ourselves. That leads us right back to this door, right? And right back to the place where we're choosing comfort and control in various aspects of our lives. We've looked already at finances and marriage and other things. As we hold on to these things, leaning into comfort and control and withholding them from God, they stay under the curse because we're acting as God ourselves. And so what happens when we have children is they come with original sin. Now, original sin represents not just an act of disobedience, but the deeper issue of self-exaltation, where humanity falsely believes we possess the wisdom to rule our own lives apart from God. All right, now that was a big statement, but it's an important statement, because every child is born with that inside of them. They know when the right time to go to bed is. They think. They know the right thing to eat. They know the right way to act. They know it's supposed to be their toy forever. They believe they can choose right and wrong, good and bad for themselves because they believe they are God over their own creation. That's just part of that original sin. So every child is born with that. And what we do as parents is we have to teach children how to share. We never, you know, no parent has ever had to teach their child how to hoard. That just kind of comes natural. We have to teach them how to share. We don't, we don't have to teach them how to be harsh. We have to teach them how to be kind. We teach them to consider others, not to consider themselves first. It's all a part of that original sin. Now, let's connect the concept of original sin with our struggle with comfort and control. And again, this is important for all of us. This isn't just parents. This is important for all of us to understand. So in John 14, Jesus said a very important phrase. 
He's talking to Thomas and the other disciples, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, this is a return to the garden. But in the garden, there's only one boss, and it's God. And it's his way. It's his truth in order to live his life. And any time we come outside of that, of his way, his truth, if it's our way and our truth, we're leaning in to comfort and control and we're withholding it from the kingdom blessing of what we can be in. So our issue of comfort and control is actually residual sin that's left in us. It's that part of our flesh that kind of leans back to the original sin. Now, when we accept Jesus, we're born again and we are a new creation. Can we thank God that we're a new creation when we get born again? That old is gone, the new has come. Now, there's still some thinking and some ways, some patterns in our life that we've got to get worked out, but we get born again. So when we think about our children, one of the number one things that we have to do is get them born again because we've got to get that sin nature out of them. So after we're born again, though, there are areas that we withhold, and like God, we choose our own way of good and evil. It's what keeps us under the curse. So here's my first point, and it's this. A parent's primary responsibility is to point their children towards Christ, his way, and his truth so that they will receive his life. The number one thing we do as parents, the number one thing we do as those who are surrounding parents with nieces and nephews and grandchildren and those that we get to come in contact with, our number one role is to point them towards Jesus because only Jesus can transform that part of their heart that was tied up in that original sin. We've got to get that out of them. Now, this is, seems simple, but it's really important to understand. And we're going to talk here in just a minute about gentle parenting and some of the co concerns I have with that. But it really comes down to this. There are two competing uh, um, ideologies going on in the world right now. And one ideology is that what we just talked about. It would be the Christian. It would be the biblical perspective, which is children are born into the world with this original sin. They need Jesus. We all need Jesus. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, God in his grace gives children time to choose him. So if we, you know, if children, uh, you know, Lord forbid, pass away at a young age, we know they go to heaven until they reach the age of accountability, somewhere around 12, 13, 14, when they can make a decision for themselves. So there's, a, there's time for that process to take place. But they need Jesus. They need to be redeemed. They need to be transformed. And it's important that we understand this because the competing ideology is the Epicurean humanism, which basically says we're all born good, it's society that is corrupt. And there's parenting philosophies that have come out of that that have us trying to negotiate with our children to get them to make good decisions. And so this is one of the things that gives, causes me concern with the idea of gentle parenting. Now, let me read a definition. So I know there's lots of different definitions about this, but let me lead, read my definition of gentle parenting. What is gentle parenting? Gentle parenting is a nurturing and empathetic approach to raising children, emphasizing understanding, respect, and connection rather than fear, control, or punishment. By focusing on building a strong parent-child relationship, Gentle parenting fosters trust and emotional security, encouraging children to grow in a healthy, balanced way. Now, that sounds fantastic, except for the sin nature. The problem is, is this doesn't acknowledge the fact that children come with a sin nature. Now, hear me, I firmly believe that parents should be gentle with their children. There's no such thing as rough parenting. We're, you know, we don't, we're not abdicating rough parenting. You know, we should have rough parenting or gentle parenting. Pick, pick your choice. No, that's not. We're supposed to have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And there's, you know, as, as parents, we're supposed to be kind and gentle and encouraging and all of those things. So we're supposed to be good parents. The problem here, though, is with the particular concept of gentle parenting, which is children are born with a sin nature, and no amount of negotiating, convincing, or bribing them is going to get a sin nature out of them. In fact, if we try to start negotiating with two-year-olds and three-year-olds and eight-year-olds, trying to bribe them into having good behavior, what are we actually doing? We're reinforcing their sin nature. We're telling them that there's a way to work the system. You can manipulate the system. If you'll just, just kind of have the right kind of behavior, you can manipulate the system and you can get what you want. And we're reinforcing comfort and control over the child. 
And now before you know it, we have a child-centered family where the child dictates the happiness in the family. The child gets to dictate if it's going to be a good time at the restaurant or not, the grocery store or not, whether we can hang out with friends or not. The child is now in control because we've not been addressing this in nature. We're on the other side of it. In fact, trying to negotiate, convince, or bribe children reinforces that sin nature by rewarding their desire for comfort and control. So this is Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Can I just tell you, when I was a kid growing up, and I had a very loving family, um, very, uh, my dad was very, a very affectionate man, but at the same time, I knew who was in charge. And my dad could look at me from across the room and get a reaction of behavioral change from me. How many of you had that dad? <laughs> right? I could look across the room and dad's looking at me. I'm like, yes, sir. I got it. I'm on it. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's something about helping kids understand who God is. God is kind. He is wonderful. He is peaceful. He has expectations. He knows that he has, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. And if you want to find the life, you got to believe in my way and my truth. There's no negotiating with Jesus. Have you noticed that? Je Jesus doesn't negotiate it with us. He doesn't bribe us. He just says, if you want to fulfill what you were created to do and live a life of blessing, just do it my way. Just come do it my way. Obedience is what brings us in. There's nothing wrong with righteous fear. Now, I'm not talking about being afraid. We shouldn't be afraid. And again, we shouldn't be harsh parents. But there should be a righteous respect of authority. So one of the most important things that we all have to learn is submission to authority. Submission to authority is a principle that every single human has to learn, and it comes down, again, to dealing with this issue of original sin. Now, the very first act of submission to authority that we have to really learn as we're growing into adulthood, if we're going to be a Christian, is to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. That's what we've been talking about in this entire series. We make him our Lord and Savior. That's what gets us inside this door, is we recognize it's not about me, but it's about him. And I have to submit my will to his will, my truth to his truth, my way to his way. And when I do that, I get to go through the door and then I get to live the life that he has in the blessing of God's kingdom realm. And so for children, we have to teach them the same thing. We have to let them know that it's about submission to Jesus. But submission and learning how to submit begins with the parents. Now, here's the thing about submission. Submission requires a choice of the one being submitted. We have to make a choice. We all made that choice when we chose to follow Jesus as our Lord. I made that choice when I decided to move my marriage into God's kingdom and be submitted to my wife as she has submitted to me. We make that choice anytime our will is crossed. And here's the thing about submission. You're not submitted. You don't know if you're submitted until your will is crossed. Right? Until this is what I want, this is what I think is best, but my authority has come in and said, no, this is right. And I say, no, this is right. And they say, no, this is right. Now we've got a problem. And I have a choice to make. I can do it my way, choosing good and evil for myself. Or I can do it God's way and choose to be submitted. And when we understand the power of submitting, you know, something Pastor Jimmy has said for years that has been so important to me is you only have as much authority as you're willing to be submitted to. In other words, you only have as much authority as you come under, which is why I am submitted to the elders and I submit in every way that I can. I'm submitted to our apostolic elders and their input in our life. I submit because submission is what opens up the realm of authority to us. The children need to learn this. But what children come baked with on the inside is this sin nature that makes them think that, no, 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 I can choose what's best for me. I know what's right and wrong. I can choose good and evil. I can be the God of my own life. And so they have to learn submission. This whole thing is about submission to authority. So now let's look at Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. Paul's talking about parenting here in this context of submission. Verse 1, he says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, 
and you will have a long life on the earth. Beautiful promise. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. And so there's two concepts here. Children obey your parents. Parents don't, over, don't frustrate your children. There, there's a balance that we have to find in parenting. And I want to encourage all parents, this is something that you'll spend the rest of your life trying to figure out this balance. And I'll tell you, just about the time you think you've got it figured out, your kids are going to go into a new phase and you've got to start all over anyway. So don't get discouraged. You're doing good. But we have to recognize there's this balance here of children obeying their parents while at the same time parents not frustrating or provoking their children to anger. Now, obedience is critical. And we only experience submission when our will is crossed, so making this choice willingly that leads to growth. So as parents, part of what our job is is to help our children make choices. And so we provide them those opportunities to make choices and they can make the right choice or the wrong choice. The right choice leads them into the blessing of God. Wrong choice comes with consequences that they need to walk in and be able to understand. And so as we do this, we have to make sure that we're though being consistent, but also that it's in balance, that we're not crazy. You know, sometimes when it's four o'clock and they've been going all day long and they're three years old and they skip their nap, it's gonna be okay. That's probably not the time to have a throwdown over submission to authority about picking up that toy. It's probably okay in this one moment for that to stay there. So we have to, as parents, be reasonable and consistent. So inconsistent parameters frustrate children. Irregular bedtimes, irregular diets. Uh, sometimes grades matter, sometimes they don't. Also, unreasonable demands for obedience can frustrate children. Sometimes we have to understand that children are just children. And we can't be unreasonable. I had a friend who was talking to me the other day, had a four-year-old, and they were taking a walk outdoors. And uh, the four-year-old boy, put it that way, four-year-old boy taking a walk outdoors, and he was just enjoying how loud he could possibly be. <laughs> he just wanted to see how far his voice could carry. And, and they're walking around outside. And the, my friend was kept going, hey, 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 use your inside voice. To which the four-year-old's going, why? <laughs> help, help, help me. Help me understand why. And then just, you know, screaming again. And, you know, and so there's a little frustration. We have to be reasonable. Four-year-old boys are not going to be quiet outside. It's surprising if they're quiet inside, much less outside. We've got to be reasonable. And then as our children get older, we, we begin to give them more and more freedom, more and more opportunity to make those choices. Often, all we need to do is let our children experience the natural consequences of their decisions. Now, as parents... We have the opportunity to allow our children to make choices. And again, we're, we're thinking about submission, submission to authority, the importance, because we want them to be submitted to Jesus and his will and his truth. And so we're going to constantly be reinforcing that form, but we give them the opportunity to make choices. But sometimes the consequences are good enough. Now, I'm not saying you should let your children play in the street so they can learn the consequences of running around with cars. As parents, we get to choose. That's too, th those consequences are too extreme, right? So I need to intervene to make sure that those consequences don't come about. Now, that being said, though, sometimes as parents, what we end up doing is because we don't want our children to experience pain or disappointment or frustration, we actually intervene in their decision-making process when the consequence could actually teach them something. So in other words, by withholding, our, our imposition of our will on them, we give them the opportunity to make a choice so that they can then process the consequences of that choice in a healthy, protected environment because we as the adult get to evaluate the risk involved versus the reward of them learning the consequence for their actions. And so I remember one time when our daughter was young, and I asked permission to share these stories. So our, our daughter was young. She was three or four years old, and we were changing her. I don't remember if we were getting her ready for bed or getting ready for the day, whatever it was. We were, we were changing her. She had a little day bed, and she was standing on this day bed, and you know, we were pulling her shirt on, all that sort of thing. And then right next to her, there was a, a, a nightstand with a lamp on it. And this is back before LEDs, so they were you know, hot light bulbs. And she looked at the light bulb, and she looked at us, to which we said, it's hot, don't touch it. She looked at the light bulb. She looked back at us. Don't do it. She locked eyes with me. This is no exaggeration. And this just tells us, you know, kind of the rest of our parenting went with her. She locked eyes with me 
reached over and grabbed the light bulb. To which I just looked at her. And we waited a surprisingly long time. And then she let go and started crying. And I was like, honey, I told you, don't touch it. It's hot. And then, of course, we tended her and we loved on her and we hugged her. But here's the thing. Instead of having a throw down over, no, don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it. You know, just don't touch it. It's hot. Let her do it and experience it. And again, we knew it, was, you know, it wasn't going to cause any real damage or anything like that. But she was going to learn heat. Now, she did hold on a lot longer than I thought <laughs> she was going to. But it was a, it was, it was a good lesson. We provide them with the opportunity to be submitted to authority and we do them no favors by withholding consequences of bad choices. Because again, we're steering them towards God. We're steering them towards who they want. Proverbs has a beautiful verse on parenting. I love this verse, Proverbs 22, 6. Train a child up, or train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's what we're doing as parents. We're training them up. Now, to train up is a very interesting word. It means to make a, dis a disciple. So to discipline as in to make a disciple. Now, we, we're going to talk about discipline a little bit. When I say discipline, I don't mean punishment necessarily. But I mean recognizing that sometimes I have to do things that I don't want to do because I need to do them. Right? Nobody got to be a great athlete by not being disciplined. Nobody got to be a great musician by not being disciplined. Nobody got to be a great business leader by not being disciplined. We have to learn to be disciplined. And we're doing a disservice to our children when we allow them to be undisciplined because what we're really doing is allowing them to grow up in life and then somebody else is going to have to discipline them somewhere down the road because we have to be discipled. To be discipled is to embrace discipline. And it also this word means to train up, to discipline, to make the path narrow, to make experienced. And another uh, phrase for this is to put, like putting a bit in the mouth of a horse. So this idea of training up literally means to constrain the path so that they move in the direction that they're supposed to go in. Now, it doesn't mean to control. It, it doesn't mean that we're, we're, we're to overly control and dominate everything. But it does mean to constrain in such a way as to help them grow in the right direction. A beautiful picture of this is planting a tree and growing a tree. How many of you know in West Texas, the wind is liable to blow, right? So if you plant a new tree, what do you have to do? You have to plant that tree in the ground and then you've got to stake it. You've got to stake it to the ground and you've got to get ropes on that thing and they put a collar around it. Now the collar is not meant to constrain. It allows the tree to grow, but it allows it to grow straight. Otherwise, it's just going to go that way. That's what it means to train up, to make the path narrow to make the decisions in the right direction, to bring constraints so that as the growth comes, it's growing and moving in the right direction. So it says, train up a child in the way. And it literally means in according to his way. In other words, every single one of our children has a unique, unique path that God has created for them. Psalm 139 tells us that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. And every day is written down before one of them comes to pass. That means your children have a book in heaven of every day that has come to pass, which also means you can be praying to God and say, okay, which way does this one go? What is, what is God calling this one to do? And you know, sometimes as parents, we feel like our job is to provide them with every possible opportunity. Now we need to provide them with the right opportunities, but what we need to do is help narrow those to help them grow how God has created them to be. And how do we do that? We pray and we ask the Lord, what, what direction are you, are you sending this child? It's not, it's not just random. And again, we should provide them with multiple opportunities. We gave our kids opportunities to become musicians. It didn't stick. <laughs> At all. Okay, great. Do something else. Let's, go, you know, let's, let's find something else. But we don't need to provide them so many options that they, can't, uh, that they get confused. We need to help guide them. And then here's what's so beautiful about this. When you train a child up in the way that they would go, when they are old, they will not depart from that path. In other words, as parents, you can be guaranteed that when you do the constraining and the training and the direction, even though they may go through a valley season, even though they may go through a hardship, even though they may wander away for a while, they will come back to the path. And that's what we are called and created to do. 
So every child is born with two conflicting things, a custom path handcrafted by God, like we talked about, and the original sin, which seeks to knock them off that path. So my second point is this, a parent's job is to continually seek the Holy Spirit for the specific path for their child and to discipline the attitudes and behaviors that would steal it from them. Attitudes and behaviors that seek to steal that path from them. This means pointing them away from their tendency towards seeking control and comfort for themselves. Now, this is not to say that children should not have a sense of self-control in their circumstances. In fact, that's a good characteristic for us to be parenting in. They need self-control. Having a strong sense of self-control is an excellent character quality. And it's a part of Christ's way. Self-control is a part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The difference between healthy self-control and unhealthy selfish control is recognizing and considering others. In other words, self-control means I'm going to deny myself something so that I can serve the greater good. The greater good of the family, the greater good of my classmates, the greater good of whatever else is going on. That's self-control. Whereas unhealthy selfish control is I'm going to control the circumstances so I get what I want when I want it. And that's the difference as parenting. We want self-control, but we don't want selfish control. You know, Kim and I had a saying when we were raising our kids, we want them to be blessed and to be a blessing to others. To be blessed and to be a blessing. Well, that means that they're going to have to learn some level of self-control. They're going to have to learn that it's not about them. You know, if there's one thing that you want to teach your children as they're growing up, it's this. It's not about you. This world is not about you. I know you think it is. I know it feels like it could be, but it's not. It's about Jesus. It's about serving God. It's about serving your family. It's about serving your siblings. It doesn't mean that you're not important and you don't have self-worth and all of those things. You are a precious child and we love you dearly, but you are not the center of the universe. Jesus is. And the moment we allow our children to become or think they're the center of the universe, then they're in that place of feeling like they're God and they're competing with God. So this leads us to the topic of disciplining our children. What does it mean to discipline? And again, remember when I say discipline, I'm not just talking about you know, punishment, but it's the overall discipline. And this is what applies to all of us. We all need discipline. Discipline is a part of being a disciple. Here's a divine principle. And you might need to say this to yourself. You might need to say it to your kids. Correction is not rejection. Correction is not rejection. You know, we have to say this sometimes even in employment uh, circumstances. We have to say, hey, correction is not rejection. In fact, it's the exact opposite. The lack of correction is actually rejection. I remember one of our boys came home from football practice one day, and he was concerned uh, because the coaches were getting on to him, but were not getting on to his buddy, though they played the same position. And so our, our son would go into practice, and then he would get coached, and he would be corrected, and they would be, you know, providing him some input. But his buddy would go in and, you know, do whatever, and he's like, okay, great. He would get out, and he's like, I don't know why I'm the one that's always getting in trouble. And I said, well, number one, you're not getting in trouble. You're getting coaching. And it's actually a really good sign that your coaches are paying attention to you. That means they see potential in you. Correction is not rejection. In fact, quite the opposite. It's acceptance and it's seeing something good that can be trained and developed. And your buddy that's not getting any correction, they don't see any hope. <laughs> I'm serious. I didn't even mean that to be funny, but it's true. He ain't going to make it. If a coach isn't correcting, it's because he doesn't see any value in trying to do that. So correction is not rejection. It's the exact opposite. So now listen, this is Hebrews chapter 12. And this is God talking to us about this. He says, as we endure this divine discipline, discipline from God, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterwards, 
there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. See, that's what, what good, healthy discipline does is it trains us. In verse 12, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. So he's giving us this encouragement from God. And this is, again, this is for all of us. God disciplines his children. If you're God's child, he's going to discipline you. He's going to guide us and direct us, and he's going to help train us up into the new things that he has. And I, I love this verse where he says, you know, and take a new grip. Get a grip is what he's saying. With your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. This is a beautiful picture because if you ever tried to set down a three-year-old that doesn't want to be set down, you know what I'm talking about? You're like, you know, you're tired of holding them, you're trying to set them down, and they just, the, the, their knees won't lock. No matter what you do, you can't get them down. And then you're trying to pick them up, and they're just like these floppy arms, and they're, they have weak knees and a weak grip, and they're just like, and God's like, don't be like this. Stop it. That's what God's saying. Embrace the discipline. And he's telling parents to do the same thing. Discipline. Here's the definition. This is, this is out of some, the, the Bible. The imposition of painful consequences or other disadvantages upon someone for their disobedience as a part of a process for improving someone's character or actions. That's what discipline does. It's meant to address the issue of improving character and or actions. Discipline's purpose is to train us in God's ways so that we can experience the life that he has for us. Proverbs 13, 24, those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Now, it's not just talking about, when we talk about the rod, it's not just talking about spanking or corporal punishment, but it's talking about the act of imposing disadvantages or consequences on your children in a way that helps guide them and direct them. Now, every parent must decide on the types and levels of punishment necessary to course correct their specific children. So Kim and I reserve corporal punishment for two things, outright disobedience and disrespect. Th those were the two things for us that got, got a spanking, basically. Outright disobedience. What do we mean by outright disobedience? Don't do that. And then they do it. You know, the, th this is the one picture that comes to mind. I can't remember which kid did it because I think they all did. You know, stop throwing your food on the floor. Okay. We're going to have to address that right now. And so that would begin to get, because that's outright disobedience and disrespect. And so we would deal and address with those things. Discipline should always point the child towards Christ and his way and his truth. The purpose of discipline is not to get the right behaviors, but to encourage the right decisions. We're trying to teach our children how to think and how to make the right choices so that that will lead them to make the right behaviors later. Now, here's some parameters when considering discipline. Does the punishment fit the crime? In other words, does the child connect the punishment with the offense in a way that helps them remember the connection in the future? You know, there's different ages that you can do different kinds of punishment, and so that just needs to be uh, selected for the child. Is this punishment tailored for the specific child? Now, in other words, some punishments work in others that don't in, in the others. You know, our kids are different. We, we had three children. Two of them were introverts. We would send them to their room, the two introverts, and they loved it. It was the best two hours of their life. So, so going to isolating introverts in their room with all their toys and stuff was not helpful. Now we had one that's the high relational guy and we sent him to his room. 30 seconds of isolation was more than enough to correct any behavior. You got to tailor it to the child and what works. The timing of the discipline, is it appropriate with the age and the memory span of the child? You know, a two-year-old is probably not going to remember 20 minutes later when they're getting in trouble for something they did 20 minutes ago. Is the context of the discipline respectful to the child or is it embarrassing to the child? Am I as a parent in the right frame of mind to administer discipline? You know, there's sometimes we just got to walk away. Or there's sometimes we just got to go, okay, you're the one that's going to have to take care of this because I, I'm just a little too upset. I'm too frustrated right now. And so I'm going to let mom take care of it and vice versa. So am I in the right state of mind? So here's some tips for applying discipline. State clearly what actions and or attitudes are being corrected. You are being put in time out for this. You are getting a spanking for this. 
Number two, state what the punishment is for those actions and or attitudes. Again, you're going to get time out. You're going to get a spanking, whatever it is. Number three, we apply the discipline. And then number four, so important, we reinforce our love and acceptance of the child while reminding them of what the appropriate actions and our attitude should have been. I love you. I accept you. Correction is not rejection. Correction is not rejection. Just because you did something wrong and we're now in a moment of discipline does not mean that you're going to be rejected and turned away. I love you. I'm so incited to hold you and to, to minister my care for you. And so that's what we did every time when we ever had any sort of discipline for our children. We always reinforced afterwards our love because remember what we're trying to do is provide that constraint, the righteous constraint, so we can train them up so they'll have something to lean against when they're making decisions to help them know who God has created them to be. As we point them towards Jesus and his way and his truth and help them to recognize that it's not about them. And if they're going to get their life inside God's kingdom realm, they got to accept Jesus and then they got to be able to submit to his will because he is the, the way. He has the truth and the life that he was created for is only them. And so the third final point is this, righteous discipline keeps us and our children on the path of life. And that's what we want to be directing them towards. Let me pray for you. Father, we're just thankful for you. And Father, I thank you that we all are to be submitted to the Father. And so even as we're thinking about parenting and we've been talking about parenting, God, we just come before you as your children. And we ask that you would guide us and direct us, that you would bless us and fill us. Let us be a submitted children. Father, it says that the fear of you is the beginning of wisdom. God, let us be a people who have a righteous fear of you, not of over-familiarity. We're thankful for you and your love, but God, also, we know that you want to grow us and develop us, so we submit to you today. And God, even as we opened up our service, we pray for every parent that's in the middle. Give them wisdom. Show them prophetically exactly how each child is going to grow. Give them wisdom for the right way to discipline. Wisdom for the right way to guide and correct. Wisdom for the right words to say. Give them emotional capacity. Especially in those years where there's a lot of emotion being expended in parenting. Refresh them right now. And I want to, I want to pray for two other groups just as a impression right now. And that is you have a child that is a little bit older but has totally gone away. Just a total wayward. And so Father, we just pray for those prodigals right now in Jesus' name and we call them back into your kingdom. And we ask that you would bring them back, that you would go before them, that you would send angels to guard and protect them and that you would bring them back. Bring them back to you. Bring them back in. God, intervene on the direction and the trajectory of their life. And let your spirit guide them, guide them home. And bless the parents who are praying and have been praying for months and in some cases years. Just refresh them in the hope that as they trained up the child that they will return to your ways. And Father, thank you that you patiently wait for us as we turn towards you. As we have our hearts that need to turn towards you. And I want to pray for those who have not yet made Jesus the Lord of your life. You've acted as Adam and Eve, trying to control your own life, deciding what's good or evil for yourselves. You haven't submitted to his lordship. You might even have, you know, prayed a prayer a long time ago, but you know you're not submitted to him as the Lord. And if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer again with me today. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I submit to you as Lord, and I receive you as Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross all those years ago to pay for my sin. I believe that God raised you from the dead, proving that you are the Son of God. Now I accept you. Come into my life. I surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that last prayer, will you take out your cell phone, text the word DECISION to 88787 so we can follow up with you. I love you guys. Y'all are incredible. Have a blessed day. God bless. We're going to take communion together as a church family. And so if you did not receive your elements on the way in, if you'll raise your hand really high, our team members are making their way around with your communion elements.
And when you receive those, just open the top portion with the cracker. We're going to hold that up. Jesus, we thank you that these elements represent your body and your blood. And we thank you, God, for your body. We thank you that you came, Jesus, so that we could know the way to our Father. Thank you for showing us what it's like to be wonderful sons and daughters of a wonderful, loving Father. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for showing us what it means to lay down our life so that we can pick up our life and live it abundantly. Let's take the bread. On the other side, if you can peel back the layer for the cup, let's raise that. Jesus, we thank you for your blood. Thank you for the power of your blood. That when we appropriate and apply it to our lives, every place we receive healing, we receive restoration, and we're a part of the family of God because of your blood. We say thank you, Jesus, as we take the cup today. Amen. Well, I want to remind you, we've got the 1015 service happening immediately following this service. And this is a wonderful topic for us as parents. And so if you've got any questions personally that you would like Pastor Jimmy to answer, you can text in those questions and receive answers on the spot. So stick around for that service. If you'll stand, I'm going to bless you before we go. Our prayer team members are making their way forward. They want to pray with you and agree with you for any need that you have in your life, a place that you need to see God move in your life. And so in the name of the Lord Jesus, I bless you today as wonderful sons and daughters of a wonderful, loving Father. I bless you to be able to do all that he's called you to do with the gift of faith and a fresh measure of strength. Amen.